Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Tracy Skatestra and this is Body Talk. Embodied Learnings brings you Body Talk every week because we're committed to bringing the body into the classroom and into the curriculum. We do this because we believe it supports student learning, student engagement, mental health and wellness, and for thriving classrooms and school cultures. Now today I have two special guests with me. We are going to be talking about cultural dance. I have Carly Cohen and Erica McNeil. And I am so happy that you're both here today. <laughs> We're very happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yes. Well, I would love if you would both start by just sharing a little bit about yourself so our viewers know um, just about your background, both as teachers and as dancers. So whoever wants to go first. Go ahead, Carly. Thanks. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Carly. Uh, I went to an art school as a child uh, and was very in love with both dance and drama growing up uh, and I did a lot of acting and dancing when I was a child and pursued it as a career um, in my adulthood and um, due to a back injury I transitioned into teaching uh, and that was about 15 years ago uh, and I have a huge passion about bringing the arts uh, to the classroom in all areas uh, and making it um, an impactful way to see the world. I always say to my students, you look into the world and you see what stories need to be told mm -hmm. and tell those stories through narratives. Um, and now I'm at an art school, um, but I did work at an at-risk youth program uh, for most of my career uh, where I built an arts program because I felt like it was art that would get them back into life. And uh, I just loved what art did uh, for human souls that were in their darkest space and how it could bring light to them. And so I did that for most of my career and now I'm with an art school and we do productions and big, you know, big, uh, different kind of hat uh, where we, we tell stories with, with art and we, we build both drama and dance pieces um, that hopefully have meaning. So that's where I am now. Mm, lovely, thank you. Erica. Uh, I'm Erica and I'm a teacher at a public school in York region. Uh, I uh, teach drama and dance uh, to the mainstream kids. I have a gifted program at my school and uh, I teach it on a rotary basis and uh, I also went to the same school as Carly. I'm, I'm I think I'm like six years older than you though Carly. So I, I went, uh, I graduated before Carly came in but then Carly and I actually met um, when our dance teacher uh, from a folk dance company, uh, so that would have been in 1984, and uh, we were in the very first cohort actually, and uh, we uh, we were able to bring um, our studies from the studio when when we were students at Claude Watson, uh, one of the dance disciplines that we uh, pursued, uh, that everybody pursued, not just whether you were a dancer or not. Uh, was uh, folk dance and it was actually it was called national dance actually mm -hmm. and uh, you know this is you know in the 80s and it was it was very important to our teacher that we recognized uh, how uh, how big the world was mm -hmm. and how we were a part of that world and he taught us uh, all of the intricacies and the nuances of um, the role that dance plays in all cultures uh, regardless of political or uh, language or any other divisive sort of uh, statuses. And uh, he really taught us uh, how to open our minds and open our hearts to uh, a real uh, inclusive uh, environment and community and taught us how dance uh, brings everybody together. And it didn't matter what generation we were from or what country we were from or what we looked like or any of those things, what our names were. It, it was, it was uh, a means to bring us together to find all those commonalities that, uh, that made us closer, that, that helped us feel like we belonged to uh, the human race, not just little factions of, of people. And that was, uh, it was game changing for a lot of us. We uh, we we traveled uh, extensively. It was a, it was a very modest group to begin with, but um, we were a very unique group in that uh, nobody really was aware of Canadian folk dance because um, I'm sure people are aware in terms of historical reference. Canada is one, if not the only country that was not formed out of war. It's a country that was formed uh, in an effort to unify 
and the whole vision of the country was to be welcoming to the rest of the world. And uh, our dances are, are definitely rooted in the original settlers, um, Scottish and Irish and British, uh, but that unique blend of that hybrid of the indigenous cultures, uh, that meeting of, of two worlds uh, and how, how they were able to create um, uh, a very unique uh, tapestry, which was the name of our group, actually, <laughs> the group. <laughs> uh, that was able to weave all of these different elements uh, of uh, identity, of cultural expression, uh, and, uh, and, and how that uh, could bring to the world stage uh, an understanding that uh, uh, we are all one people. And it was, uh, we were very young. I was, I was in grade eight at the time, so I was 14 when the group started. Carly was like in grade four. <laughs> we were really little, right? And um, we, uh, we met people from all over the world, uh, com companies from all over the world, and, and we taught each other, and nobody spoke. There were few people in our group that could speak other languages, so, you know, you know, the Chinese group. And, um, my sister could speak a bit of Chinese. There was an Italian group and an Italian musician. So we had a little bit of crossover that way, but generally speaking, it was all nonverbal communication. And it didn't matter because uh, we would just they would do a step and we'd do a step. And then we'd watch one of the dances and we'd say, oh, you start in a circle. We, we start in a circle too. And then we'd, we'd look at how the dances were similar or they'd play their music and we'd show them how our dances could match their music. Even though it was from two different cultures. It was really... It was very interesting. It was very powerful. It was. Yeah. It was really, and I, I think at the time when we were going through that, I don't think we, it even uh, registered for us uh, of what kind of impact it was having on us in very formative years. I mean, by the time we traveled, we were in high school, I was in university, mm -hmm. and we were really young. And I mean, I don't know how trips are organized these days for a school, but I, I don't know many teachers who would willingly go, you know, across borders through uh, customs with pulse passports and multiple, multiple baggage systems. We <laughs> went to France oh in the gosh, summer yes. of grade nine. We yeah, went to yeah. France for a month. So on, on, on the director's off time, uh, he, he and the musical director took us to France for a month, almost. It was like three and a half weeks. Like, yeah, yeah. And it was all through Southern France and it was very powerful. And we also billeted with local um, people in local towns. And the power of that, because you're immersed into the culture, you eat the food that they eat, you drink the drinks that they eat, you listen to the conversations in whatever language um, that the, you know, they're in. And uh, it, was, it was incredible. It actually inspired me to take Spanish and French right through high school. Um, and still to this day, I, I review Spanish. I love languages. And it came from my um, connection. I still talk to some of the people I met in Italy uh, when I was in when I was 18. Um, we still have that connection. Thank, thanks to Facebook and other things. But um, it's that's the power. And and Erica said, you know, it's it's that power of this um, communication through the arts. You know, we didn't have to speak the you know perfect English to get everything out. We did it through our hearts, through the dance. And um, you know, going back to um, we. Uh, Erica was talking about how um, Canada was was settled on these peaceful um, inclusion pieces. So, for example, when these um, the Irish came through, they didn't have their swords, and so we use brooms. And just like the same dancing over the sword that you would have seen in the Irish dancing, we would dance over brooms. And so there was all this transformation about how we took these dances and made them our own. Uh, it was, very moving and most people don't know that Canada has all these influences and how how um, these dances came about and so it was lovely to share that as well uh, with the world. And now you know as teachers I'm sure Carly does this in her class those dances that uh, we learned uh, we're now teaching our own students and that's these right. steps are passed on from however many generations it's been. Well, and the Irish same steps, same steps. Yep. 
But the beautiful thing is how um, Mr. Hyde taught it. He always honored the origin and the history. So we would learn the translation of the dance and we would um, learn uh, what it meant and why it was used in the culture and how important it was and all these little nuances before we even learned the dance. And then he would make us notate them. And I remember being mad about that. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to write. I want to dance. And he'd be like, no, no, the notation is very important because how are you going to pass it on? And I was like, yeah, okay. I was too young to really get it. And now 43 years old teaching dance, I actually use those notations. Like I have my grade four notations and I still use them. Um, and so that's how powerful these, these pieces are because they're, they're, they're not complicated to teach. And so everyone feels great in them. They, they, they build self-confidence, they build community, and everyone's part of this um, beautiful moment of, of experience. Uh, no matter what dance you use, it, it does all those things. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really an, an amazing thing, if you think about it, that that had that kind of impact that we're still using it today. Yeah. And it's really neat watching students of this generation. I mean, these are kids, obviously, like I'm, I'm 49. So these students are old enough to be my kids. Some of them are, I could be a grandmother at some point, anytime now, right? <laughs> so my point is, though, exactly, Tracy, your grandmother, she can appreciate this. It's a little freaky sometimes when you think about it. But the point is, is these kids are doing dances that I did when they, I was their age. And they're, they're learning and, and they're, you know, they all come in and they're all, they're dropping their backpacks and they got their headphones and they've got their phones and everything. But then as soon as the music comes on, they all file into the space and they get into their circle and they just start. And I don't say a word. I just put the music on and they know, they, they know when to start. And, and uh, we, if it's a circle dance, I'll have the inner circle and the outer circle. The people who know the dance, they'll go in the middle and they lead. And then the kids on the outside, they'll follow along. Somebody's been away. Somebody broke their leg. Somebody doesn't want to dance that day. It's fine. And that nonverbal communication of acceptance and inclusion and, and leadership and, uh, and communal experience is such a powerful tool in the classroom because it, it teaches them that uh, knowledge is not necessarily academic. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is not restricted to uh, books or writing or numbers or testing. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is equally powerful in our bodies and equally powerful in our experiences and most specifically our shared experiences mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. Yeah, like look at what, okay, so we, we lost our dance teacher uh, two years ago now, and we had a memorial service for him. And you know, you know how Facebook works, so you know, you tell people, and I looked at the invitations, and there's, you know, 80 responses. So I'm like, oh, it, it'll be nice, you know, it'll be good to see everybody. And honestly, there were over 200 people at this memorial, because they all came back to dance together again. And you know, we, we decided we were going to honor him by recreating one of the dances. And I, we all thought like, oh, we're old now. How are we gonna even remember this? And we got together in a room, I'm not kidding. And we put on this Irish medley and within one minute, we all just danced back in again, but like by rote, like maybe there was like maybe a section B, like two steps, maybe we forgot, but the whole thing came back to all, like all of us, all of a sudden we were just all dancing. 30 years later. Absolutely. And what? I, like, we couldn't believe it. We were in tears. We were like, Hi, each other. it was so beautiful. Um, that's the power of dance. It reminds me of a video that's actually, um, I've seen many people posting, I posted it the other day as well, of a woman who was a prima ballerina, I think with the New York <gasps> Ballet. I saw that, yeah. I will share. my eyes out. It so, and, and it says, yeah. you know, wait for the tears, and I'm like, I'm not gonna cry, it's a video. Bald my eyes out, yeah. bald my I'll eyes out. The music and her whole body. As soon, and, and you can see it, you can see her mm -hmm. body, and the muscle memory and the emotional quality that you remember in the over and over the rehearsals that you do, the hours that you do that, there's no, there's nothing like it. There is really no, there's nothing yeah. like it. And that's why when we integrate dance into the curriculum, we bring movement into everything we do that students have a recall they because they remember it, because they feel it, because it's internalized, right? It's that embodied that's right. experience. And so that's, right. that's the same thing that you had, but in the sense of learning about uh, dance 
that tells a story that has history that you know that's what's important. different about folk dance yes yeah, so absolutely talk about that because that's i think that's really important like let's talk about what makes it different well, you've talked about some of the things that make it really important before we even like learned the dances he would talk to us about why people danced in the first place and that's it, it you know it really addresses and taps into that um that ritual uh and and uh what's the word the, the culture, the tradition that dance is steeped in, mm -hmm. that when people dance, it was very rarely for demonstration and exhibition. It was to celebrate, Community. or to mm -hmm. mourn. It was a transition, it was a, it was a rite of passage. It was to train, to train warriors. It was to teach kids uh, how to grind flour, how to uh, reap the, 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 the harvest. And they were uh, daily, uh, uh, exercises that were put to a rhythm and so that it's a very uh, a very fundamental need that we have as humans to move together in unison and and to and to build community together and and when we when we learn to dance in unison in to, in a rhythm it uh it has this effect on our heartbeats, on our pulse, on, on just uh, our energy levels when you move together like that. And cultural dance is, I mean, all forms of dance have their own validity. There's no question. But there's something about cultural dance that um, it helps people find their identity and, and how that identity connects to other people's identities. I think that's the difference because it's not an aesthetic. It's not based on, you know, how much, how, how high your leg goes or what angle your body can stand at or how flexible you are. It's not based on any of those typical criteria for dance um, evaluation. It's based on uh, your ability to be responsive to other people who are sharing space with you responsive to the music, responsive to the cultural meaning behind the dance and, and the purpose of, of moving. And that's what, that's what their value, I mean, we had, we had to do exams, there's no questions, there were dance exams, and, but we weren't being evaluated on what we looked like, we were being evaluated on how we contributed to the group process. And, and that's the unique part, the unique aspect of cultural dance is that it's not an aesthetic. It's not based on uh, appearance. So I'm just curious. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking a lot about uh, as you've been talking is this sense of vulnerability that people have just being in their bodies and moving. And, and so when I teach my university students, again, a lot of them are coming without any dance background, but immediately there's a lot of fear and discomfort around just even imagining starting dance. And, and so either they think they have to learn a dance and perform it solo, or it's so free that they're going to be out there improvising with absolutely no structure. So they're kind of on opposite ends. And I'm curious with cultural dance, um, sort of where, it, where that sits and how students respond. And I'm curious, Carly, you know, sort of where you see that with your students. Right, so uh, it's very welcoming. Uh, so a lot of the dances start in that circle, and that circle is that community. So mm -hmm. already we're united and together and um, part of something important. Mm -hmm. And then all, often uh, with cultural dancing, it's uh, there's a repetition about it. Mm -hmm. So once you learn that, you know, section A, section A repeats many times. And so they feel free to just experience it wholeheartedly because there isn't that, as Erica said, that stress about technique or any of that. It's just, we're, we're together, we're doing it. And by the time you repeat this series, the third time, you just let go and have fun. And I use it a lot to build community actually right at the beginning of class uh, of my term, because we do get into technique later. We, we are looking at shows and those kinds of stresses. And so, but you can only take those risks when you have that community built. And so I always, and I, I love honoring all, I actually find out where all the students of my class are from, if they have ancestors that are from different parts uh, of the world, where their heritages are. And so I, 
I want, I even, if I know dances from those particular heritage, uh, I bring it into the classroom right away. Uh, so we, we value uh, each individual in the class and what they, they come with and what they bring and what those traditions are about. And we, I even have them interview um, their, their ancestors and uh, whoever they're connected with about what those traditions were and, um, and those values. And we talk about those things just like in Mr. Hyde uh, type of uh, way he structured everything. Um, I also believe in the importance of history and honoring history and honoring um, where we've come from and how that, um, uh, how, how we honor the space. And so I also, you know, go deeply into di indigenous dance and indigenous culture because we are on the land and we honor uh, where we've come from first. And then we say, here are all the other influences. Uh, and so I use it to build community right at the beginning of any semester. Mm -hmm. uh, just so powerful. There's usually laughter, there's celebration. We have woo, like these kids are like, you know, you know, uh, cheering while we're dancing. Like it's a really beautiful uh, building of community. And it's one of the ways in the quickest, I find. Amazing. I remember when I was in grade five and only the grade fives in our school were allowed to do maypole dancing. And so we had these giant maples, you know, with the big ribbons that came yeah. down and you do all these intricate Beautiful. things and we'd go to festival and then that was it. And then the next group came in the next year and they got to do it. And I loved it so much. And that was the first year I was 10 where I really just, that was when I was like, I want to dance. I had been in gymnastics. I want to dance. And I just wanted to do the maple year after year after year. And so, you know, then I decided, well, I'm going to have to you know, perform jazz for like the talent day and do these other things. But, you know, there was something about it where I actually did feel, I remember that connection I felt with my peers in a way that we didn't get in other, any other sense. And I feel this is really getting, so one, I think that just dance within our own community, within our own culture is lost, is getting lost. And I think these experiences in schools are also getting lost. So I agree with you. I actually run a camp as well. And um, I decided, there was a presentation at the end, and I decided to make the parents get up with their kids and mm -hmm. did the maple leaf stomp, which is like a partner dance where the, the child faces the parent and they do this whole kind of partner thing. And at first, you should have seen the parents are like, you know, and I was like, go <laughs> get the parent. It's okay. Bring them up. It's, they'll love it. Just let's go. And, I was like, just don't listen to them. Go get, and they did. They brought their, you know, their parent up and they were like being a good sport. Well, I'm telling you, I taught it. It's a repetitive thing. So once you teach it one, I taught it and the parents were laughing. They were just right inside of it. And I've done it every year since. I've run that camp for years. And every year I do this now. And it was like a spontaneous thing. I just kind of was like, you know what? We need a little culture. Let's go, right? It's the Canadian equivalent of the chicken dance. Think of the chicken yeah. dance, right? From Germany or Austria, you know, where they, that's the party dance. The Canadian, the maple leaf stomp is our yeah. version of that. The mix and, and it was all. amazing. All these like, very serious, very, you know, the, the lawyer, the doctor, the dentist. <laughs> And up, up they got and, you know, because they couldn't say no to their children. And you should have seen them transform their faces. They were giggling. The tile was loosened. <laughs> they just had the best time. Yeah. I oh. wish we could do that more. Yeah. Have yeah. those moments. That's amazing. Beautiful. Yeah. That's a really good point, though, Carly's bringing up about the generational uh, inclusion and, and, and working together. We're, we're so divided now, you know, into grades, you know, like the, you're, you're with people just because you were born the same year and you live in the same neighborhood. And uh, we're really losing touch with that intergenerational experience that we would all benefit from. Yeah. Uh, seniors would benefit equally. Uh, working with uh, young children as young mm -hmm. children would benefit from spending time with their elders. Yeah, absolutely. This is why I'd like to put it right into curriculum, you know? Yeah. I make them go, to, this is oral tradition, this is a value, let's go talk to our elders and learn and, and bring that back and we create pieces around it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I just think that value is totally lost in our, in our yeah. culture and in our generation, absolutely.
Yeah. And cultural dance for sure. I mean, it's one thing, you know, we've watched those videos of the dads wearing the tutus and learning the ballet sequences with their dollar. And, that, and it's cute. Yeah. It's entertainment though. So mm -hmm. cultural dance is uh, an experiential passage, mm -hmm. a process that everybody can go through together and we can all be novices together and we can bring people it's accessible to everyone. It's not just people who have training mm -hmm. or who have a skill, right. right? It's something that everybody can do and it's not and necessary to be a, 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 an expert in it. Yeah. And you yeah. can do folk dance in addition to other things that you can do with your life. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a professional dancer, I mean, you're living, eating, breathing, speaking, sleeping, ballet, or ballroom dancing, you know, when it's a discipline and folk dance is one of those things that just sort of enhances your li living experience. It's mm -hmm. not something that is your living experience. You know, and it's, oh, uh, yeah. it's a different, it's a very different uh, process of learning, of yeah. movement integration. It's a very different. I think we need to talk about cultural appropriation. Okay. I think we can't talk about cultural dance without talking about cultural appropriation. So, I mean, the one thing that you brought up a little earlier about is, you know, how uh, these dances are passed down. So they're passed down through, again, keeping notations, um, again, you know, teaching. So just teaching and other people learning. Um, and uh, where does, so I've, I've often been thinking about, so how do things evolve? How do they shift? And also, um, you know, how, we can appropriate. And of course, there's a lot of, of talk around, especially with indigenous um, dance, or just indigenous art in general about, you know, needing permission, um, and having inviting somebody in and being very careful that we're not appropriating. So, but a lot of people don't really understand even what it cultural appropriation really means. Either they're afraid, like I can't touch it at all, or they don't think about it or they misinterpret it. So let's, let's go there. And I think you both have very different perspectives. So I, of course, love to hear from both of you in terms of your thoughts on what it means. Well, for me, I think that um, appropriation, well, specifically cultural appropriation is uh, something that requires uh, not just awareness, but an education. Because um, usually what they are referring to when it's uh, viewed in a derogatory sense uh, is if the culture that is the dominant culture is taking or changing something about uh, the dominated culture and using it for uh, self-interest. I'm trying to think of an example sort of in merchandising. You know what, the easiest example just as a teacher, as an elementary teacher, is um, a costume, for example. Uh, Halloween, which is past. And I know that, um, you know, costumes that have been popular in the past that they are now not allowed to sell anymore are costumes that are uh, indigenous, mm -hmm. costumes from uh, the Orient, for example. And, uh, and I'm, I can say this not just as somebody of, who is a visible minority, but I can say this as a Canadian. Uh, these costumes are not researched. Uh, they've been Hollywoodized for all intents and purposes, and they've been glamorized, and they've been uh, fetishized. I mean, uh, let's be honest. And, um, and that's an example where cultural appropriation is, uh, in fact, harmful because it's not uh, the purpose of taking on a costume is not to to build the culture that you are appropriating. Mm -hmm. The purpose is to enhance your own, uh, it's for your own advancement. So uh, um, makeup that is done in the style of an indigenous uh, culture or uh, stylings on costumes in fashion uh, adding uh, accessories or, or decoration that is not researched, first of all, and is being done to uh, become some sort of exotic look, some desirable exotic look, is an example of using another culture in an uneducated manner uh, in order to build yourself up or to build a company up. 
right. or to build um, uh, merchandising or to in, encourage consumerism. <laughs> and, and so that would be an example of cultural appropriation. It, this is my opinion. I am not a researcher. I am not an academic. I'm just a teacher. That's just how I, how I try to treat uh, when we're learning about other cultures in my own classroom. Um, in terms of how we refer to cultural appropriation when we're learning about other cultures, um, I think it's really important to recognize that all voices need to be at the table. All, all parties need to be at the table when we're discussing things and when we're learning things. And that one interpretation of, of, of an historical event or one interpretation of an historical perspective is not necessarily the only one. And to recognize that most of the voices in our textbooks, uh, in our stories that are passed on, in the music that we project in, in social media in general, is dominated by one culture and one gender. I mean, we all here are female, so isn't it interesting? You know, we've got female voices, and yet our culture is continues to be, I, I don't have the statistics, but you know, we're both in teaching, all three of us are in the education profession, right? And it's a predominantly female profession. Mm -hmm. So where is the disconnect? Where, where if, if it's females who are passing on this information, who's, who's, it's where the money lies, you know? Like who's paying for the textbooks? Who's hiring the people to do the research for the textbooks? Who's hiring the people to sell the textbooks? Who are the faces behind the textbooks that are being, that, uh, how the academics are being passed on and how the research is being uh, funded? And those are the big, those are the hard questions that uh, one person, even one body of people is not really in a position to be able to judge. So um, people who are very quick to criticize and, and accuse others of cultural appropriation, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to point fingers than it is to look in the mirror, right? And I find that people who are quick to judge and quick to criticize uh, are, it, it can be a bit of a bait and switch, a bit of a, uh, smoke and mirrors, don't mind man behind the green, behind the curtain sort of thing, you know, like, mm -hmm. I think we need to be accountable for ourselves, our own decisions and, and, and the voices. I think as teachers, we need to be responsible for what we are presenting, so that it's as unbiased and as objective as possible. And uh, in, do, in endeavoring to do that, it's our responsibility to make sure that we keep our own privilege in check and that we recognize our own bias because that's the nature of being human is to be biased because right. we are subjective. We, we can speak from our own perspective. And so no, nobody, none of us are in a position to be speaking uh, from anybody else's perspective. Yeah, thank you. So Carly, I'd love to hear from you because I have a feeling that you agree, but also may have other things to say. I do, I do agree <laughs> uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. I just worry um, that it, we're, we're getting so sensitive Yes. Uh, now that we're actually I, making people afraid mm. to explore and learn about stories that might not be like I'm Jewish, so I'm allowed to talk about the Holocaust, but Erica's not Jewish, so she's not really allowed to tell narratives about the Holocaust because she's not Jewish. And that's dangerous to me. Um, for example, uh, Black History Month, my students always we learn deeply about the history of slavery. And I think it's so important that we learn these stories and we learn these narratives and we hear these voices of, of people who uh, suffered and were victims of, of these past. And from that, I still ask my students who are not black, because there are no black students in my classroom, just, just who is in my classroom. Um, and so I still want them to, um, and we're not, we're not appropriating, in my opinion, we are sharing knowledge, sharing the history and sharing these stories in the most human hearted way to, um, to share the information with the school community where there's very few voices uh, of um, that, um, that heritage to be able to have, have their voice heard. Um, 
I do believe that we still need to tell these stories, even if we're not um, from that specific heritage, because otherwise those stories won't be told. Mm -hmm. We're not pretending we're black telling a story. We are embodied the emotion. We've embodied the pain. We've embodied the victim uh, stories in a different way, in an honest way, in a, in a heartful way. And I, I do believe we still have impact on the audience because they're still learning those precious stories. Otherwise, they wouldn't be told in our school because the people who in this you know, in this sensitive context would only be allowed to tell stories. And so I, I also was part of something called the Quest Conference this year. And the focus was um, a kind of an indigenous focus. Uh, and I always do these big pieces for these Quest Conferences. And this year I was like, well, this was last year, sorry. I was like, uh, you know what, I'm just not going to do it because I just don't want anyone to judge me. And I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not indigenous, so I can't really have anything to offer. And I got really nervous. And the Quest people reached out and they're like, I, we don't see your name, like you're not gonna do anything. And I was like, well, it's a bit of a, you know, a topic that I don't wanna touch because someone's gonna get mad at me. And they were like, well, can you just consider doing something anyway? So I reached out to Tamara Pademski, who is an indigenous artist, part of our dance company that we were talking about earlier. Um, she's a, very powerful human, uh, professional artist, uh, half ind indigenous and half Jewish. So both her ancestors came from the wow. residential schools and the Holocaust. Okay. Human. Um, so uh, she came uh, and and in one minute broke down all my, no, you know, stop with all your judgment, judgy McJudgies. Like if it comes from the heart and if, you know, if you're telling the story honestly um, from the emotional space, you're fine. You know, and we uh, build a piece together around, the, you know, the, with my students. Uh, and it, but I let her lead it because uh, there was indigenous dancing in it as well, and it was um, for for the uh, in honor of the residential schools and all this stuff. But it was a really interesting conversation to have with her because I was so nervous. Like in my own school, I, I knew I was doing the right thing, but on a you know big stage like this and in that type of theme, I was, I was like, uh, no, uh, and she built this stunning piece and we did it and it honored, you know, the, the victimhood in a really honest way. And there, again, was not one indigenous human on the stage, but they were all uh, emotionally connected. I had them uh, go out into their ancestry and say, did anyone have a traumatic experience? Here's, here's the story of the residential school. Can anyone connect to this type of experience in any possible way. And we had a, you know, a, a grandmother from Auschwitz who talked about her experience. We had um, a, a grandmother from Poland who was um, sent away uh, so that she wouldn't be in the war and she was sent to some other country. She didn't have any friends. She didn't know anybody. She was like isolated, couldn't speak the language, what that was, that tra trauma and uh, being thrown in another culture, just like the residential. So we made all these connections um, from their own family and their own heritages that we use that to ground it and to make it their own. So they were connecting to the trauma. They weren't trying to be anybody but themselves and honoring the victims in that way. And so I, as an artist, I really, and an educator, I just, we've just got to be a little bit careful because I think people are quick to say, oh, white privilege, or well, you can't talk about that, or you can't do this, you can't do that. But if you're the only person who can tell that story in that community, then you better tell that story or that story will never be told. I don't, if, if, if a Jewish person doesn't live in wh wherever and it's Holocaust Education Week, whoever needs, whoever's there, please tell a story. Holocaust, so it doesn't happen again. Like, I, I don't care who you are, you know, so I'm, a little bit quietly passionate about care, being careful about that line. Like we should never mock another culture. We never pretend we are someone we're not and all and exactly what Erica said, but at the same time to do it in an honorable way and to tell these stories to honor people's lives. I think that's a really important mission as well. Yeah. One of my, um, so we, in the, so at Western in the course that I teach the dance and drama and I teach to the elementary cohort, they uh, do a uh, performance. So they learn about the dance and the drama strands of the arts curriculum. 
and then they start to build a performance based on a social justice topic. And many of them like to choose Indigenous issues. So that could be residential schools. I've had some of them um, talk about missing and murdered Indigenous women. And so today, one of the students, we just started the process and she said, is it okay if we pick an Indigenous topic? I'm like really nervous. And I said, absolutely. And what you said is what I basically let them know. You are not taking on a role. You're not pretending to be someone you're not. What you're doing is you are going to tell a story through um, doing your research and really looking at the issue and bringing attention to it through the emotion, through the, through the storytelling. And you use the art as your vehicle to do that. Mm -hmm. So you can share the, the, you know, the devastation of, of losing your culture, being removed from your family. You can show that emotion through dance, but you're not playing the role of the indigenous person. And, and she just, was like the light bulb went off and she went, oh, and I know for them, this is very new and they don't really know how to do that yet. And we're gonna build that. But, they, but by the end, the pieces they put together as these very novice, students it's beautiful exactly. it's really really amazing they they're su they surprise themselves the only is this year they can't perform it they have to record everything and create a video but um anyway but thank you for making both of you for really articulating that so beautifully i think these are conversations we do need to have more i do feel the sensitivity uh well there's just so much sensitivity about everything right now but there have been some moments not you know, just around the arts, even recently that I have seen where, um, you know, it's just, it's like, why is that? You know, it's just interesting about how there's been a lot of shaming and finger pointing for people wanting to, um, you know, tell a story. And there's this confusion all the time, again, around privilege and who gets to do what. And, and so I really appreciate the attention um that you brought to that so well we are really running out of time but i wondered if there was any sort of last minute i, I think we've covered everything that i had hoped we could possibly cover um, i'm just so thrilled and i hope lots of people are able to watch this and really learn from you but is there any last parting words that you either, both have um, I, I just want to, um, if people are asking about uh, resources for looking for um, cultural dance resources, I know I touched on it on uh, the blog that we did, Tracy. Yeah, it's coming out, it'll come out just after this um, Right, video. so the uh, Ontario Folk Dance Association is a fantastic resource that is uh, experiencing a revival of sorts. Um, it used to be very much, uh, you know, the elders, a uh, community of elders, and they've really um, been able to break through that uh, lull. And uh, if you go on their website and you have a look at their uh, YouTube channel and subscribe, there is a plethora of resources there of music and dances, notations, historical context, costumes, uh, just a phenomenal resource, the Ontario Folk Dance Association. I highly recommend that uh, people have a chance to, to have a look at that resource. Um, yeah, I'm going to make if sure. You, yeah, I will link your, I'm going to link your blog. Yeah. And I'm also going to link that for sure. And Carly, if there's anything else that you recommend, and of course, any parting words, anything else you want to share? I just, um, I just think dance is such a part of the human spirit and that we are so lucky to uh, connect in such a deep way when we when we join together uh, in that form of art and I've seen students transform in a studio um, so fully and come to life uh, when I was teaching those at-risk uh, students these simple dances changed change their energy within minutes. Uh, and that is the power. You know, it's a, it's a tough time right now, this COVID time. And I think we can use dance, um, you know, as a way to connect and to pull together and to lift our own spirits. Um, and uh, it, it has a power. It's been around for since the beginning of time for a reason. Um, and um, let's use it. Let's use it and let's build community and let's um, lift our spirits and be connected. Well, that is beautiful words. And I feel so inspired. I 
really hope that in the future I can join a uh, cultural dance group because uh, I just love dancing and I just want to be a part of it. So uh, the whole time we were talking, I thought, oh, I need to do that. Yeah, <laughs> I need to go back and, and get that joy that I felt when I was in grade five. Being made. Never too late. Never too late to join <laughs> no. the Maple. Yeah. And I started contemporary dance again last year. So I've been oh, doing good, 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 good. So why not add a little folk dance to it at the same time? Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Yes. Anyway, thank you both so much. It was just lovely to have you here. And I just want to say thank you to our viewers for watching. And again, we will um, give you all the information. So if also, if you want to reach out to Erica or Carly, uh, I can make that happen for you as well. If you haven't been to our website, it's www.embodiedlearnings.com. And until next time, thank you for being here and I wish you well. Thanks, Chase. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.